Welcome to Classes with Abhish. Today we will continue our series on dynamics and specifically we will go over different kind of forces and the forces that are applicable in classical mechanics and then we will move on to the application of Newton's laws of motion and see how to correctly apply those in different situations so we are better positioned to solve any kind of problems. Okay, so with that let's start. So forces can be broadly categorized into four different types. First is gravity or gravitational force. Next is electromagnetic force. Third is weak nuclear forces. And fourth is strong nuclear forces. So first of all, let's talk about gravitational force. Newton's law of gravitation states, if there are two point masses of m1 and m2, which are separated by a distance r, the gravitational force on m1 due to m2 and vice versa is an attractive force. So both m1 and m2 attract each other. And we can write the gravitational forces G, which is the gravitation constant, M1 times M2 divided by R square. The constant G is 6.67 into 10 to the power minus 11 Newton meter square per kg square. Okay. So on this one, we are assuming that these masses are point masses. If it was an extended mass, then we have to consider the gravitational pull of every particle of mass 1 on mass 2 and vice versa to be able to calculate the total force of gravity. But for generic purposes, we can reduce a problem if we consider this point mass as the center of mass. Okay. Electromagnetic force is applicable between two charges. Let's say Q1 charge and Q2 charge. Now, the assumption made here is both these charges are stationary. They are at rest. If the charges are moving, a whole other set of dynamics comes into place. We will discuss that in uh, some later, later lessons. But let's say two charges, Q1 and Q2, which are stationary, they are separated by a distance r, then the electromagnetic force we represent by Fc, which is Coulomb force, will be 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught, where epsilon naught is the permittivity in vacuum, times the product of the charges Q1, Q2 divided by r square. So just uh, remember this, that Q1 and Q2, we will have to consider the signage of that. So if it is a positive charge, it's positive. If it's a negative charge, it's negative. So it follows then the Coulomb force can be both attractive or repulsive. If it is opposite charges, one is positive, another is negative, then it's an attractive force. If both are of the same signage, then it's a repulsive force. Okay. Now this constant 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught is equal to 9 into 10 to the power 9 newton meter square per coulomb square. Okay. Next is weak nuclear force. Now weak nuclear forces are short range forces. Weak nuclear forces are experienced in the reactions involving protons, neutrons, and electrons. Okay. And the range at which they are found is much smaller than the size of a proton or neutron. Anything longer than that range, these weak nuclear forces cannot be established at all. Okay. So when, let's say, a beta decay happens, okay, these forces are found during such reactions. Lastly, strong nuclear forces 
these also are short range forces. Now, where are strong nuclear forces found? Now, imagine the nucleus of an atom. There are protons and neutrons and some other subatomic particles in the nucleus. Now, protons are all positively charged. Now, based on the electromagnetic force of repulsion, because both all protons are same charge, it's very difficult to hold a nucleus together. So, there must be some other force that is there that overcomes this electromagnetic repulsion and uh, holds the nucleus together. So, those are strong nuclear forces. They are also very short range forces and these are experienced only if the interacting particles have protons or neutrons or both. And um, these are effective only in ranges of 10 to the power minus 15 meter or less. Okay. So, within that range, strong nuclear forces can overcome electromagnetic repulsion forces. But as soon as the range is more than 10 to the power minus 15, the strong nuclear forces do not apply. And then Coulomb force is much more than the strong nuclear force. So broadly, these are the four types of forces. However, you will see that weak nuclear force and strong nuclear force, classical physics does not apply to these types of forces. To explain these forces, because the ranges are so small and the particles involved in these forces are themselves very small, we need a different set of physics laws, which is called quantum physics. So, quantum physics can explain these kind of forces. Now, gravity and electromagnetic forces, these can be easily explained by classical physics laws. Classical physics comprises of Newton's laws of motion, Newton's laws of gravitation, Maxwell's laws of electromagnetism, laws of thermodynamics and Lorentz force. Okay. There is one another situation where classical physics does not apply and that is when velocities are almost close to speed of light or roughly we can say of the order of 10 to the power 8 meter per second. Then also classical physics laws do not apply. We need a different field of physics which is called relativistic mechanics. Okay. So, I wanted to make this distinction so you understand what type of forces we are dealing with in classical physics. And now we will go into much more details about the gravitational force and the electromagnetic force and see what are the different types of forces within this. Uh, that we need to consider and see how we can apply those classical physics laws. Let's now talk about gravitational force. Two bodies attract each other by virtue of their masses. So like we mentioned, if there are two point masses, m1 and m2, and they are separated by a distance of r, then by virtue of their masses, they attract each other and that attraction force is gravitational constant g times m1 m2 by r square. Okay. Similarly, if we had one extended body and we had another extended body, let us say this is body 1, this is body 2. And let us for a moment assume this extended body comprises of three particles and this body two also comprises of three particles. Okay. There will be many more but for simplicity let us say there are three particles. Now if I represent F I J as the force of gravity on the ith particle. of 1 by the jth particle of 2. So, this F i j is force on the ith particle of 1 by the jth particle of 2. 
then the total force of gravity between 1 and 2 or total force of gravity that is experienced by 1 because of 2 is the sigma summation of all ij okay what does that mean it means the first particle let's say this is the first particle it will have an attractive pull due to all the three particles of number two okay the second particle of number one will have an attractive pull due to each of the particles of number two similarly the third particle will have an attractive force due to each particle of number two so which means then the total force in this case will be f11 plus okay spherically symmetric bodies which do not in intersect each other we can assume that their entire mass is concentrated on the center and the distance between the two centers let's see if that is r then again the gravity force of gravity between these two spherically symmetric bodies is g m1 m2 by r square okay now let's talk about a situation where we have earth Okay, this is the earth, this is the center of the earth and there is a small body near the surface. So, it is important to mention that this body is near the earth's surface. So, what does that mean? It means effectively because earth's radius is much much more compared to the size of this sub object we can effectively say that this object is the center of mass of that object is at a distance r which is the radius of the earth from the center of the earth okay now then if r is the radius of earth we know the radius of earth is 6400 kilometers we know the mass of the earth 6 into 10 to the power 24 kg we know our gravitational constant is 6.67 into 10 to the power minus 11 newton meter square per kg square now if the small mass near the earth's surface is m okay then the force of gravity on the small mass m is g small m times the mass of the earth divided by r square okay if we bring m outside and then we combine all the constants which is g m by r square and if we substitute these values we will find that that value evaluates to 9.8 meter per second square okay which we denote as another constant small g so that is the reason when we say what is the weight of an object near the earth's surface we say it is m times acceleration due to gravity so this we define as acceleration due to gravity now it is important to mention here that g is roughly 9.8 or sometimes it is also approximated to 10 meter per second square near earth surface what happens if this body 
was at a distance away from the earth's surface and this distance is comparable to the radius of the earth then this denominator r will increase if it increases g decreases so as body moves or is body is moved further away from the surface g decreases okay let's talk about electromagnetic force now We said if two charges Q1 and Q2 are at rest with respect to an observer and they are separated by a distance of R, then the Coulomb force Fc is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught Q1 Q2 by R square. Okay. Now, since Q1 and Q2 could, could have different signage, this Coulomb force or electromagnetic force can be attractive or repulsive. Now, this force manifests in different ways. For example, if there are two surfaces in contact, due to two surfaces being in contact, there could be different kind of forces that are applicable on the surface of contact on these two surfaces okay how do these forces originate that is because of electromagnetic forces the charged particles of those two surfaces they interact with each other and that's the reason for any surface force that might arise now typically let's say we have one surface inclined surface like this and then there is another object placed on this surface like this okay so perpendicular to this surface there could be forces acting like in this instant on this object there could be a normal reaction that is a example of surface force and there could also be a frictional force which is parallel to the surface okay both these forces originate because of the two surfaces being in contact okay so we can say two forces perpendicular to surface of contact and the other one is parallel to the surface in contact surface of contact Okay. Now let's say tension in a string. That too is an example of electromagnetic force. For example, let's say there is a string which is attached to the ceiling and then there is a body hanging from it. Now the tension in the string which acts away from the bodies exerts an electromagnetic force on the bodies attached to the ends of the string okay and this tension is always away from the body another example of electromagnetic force will be force on a spring so let's say there is a spring which has no forces acting in the horizontal direction then the length of the spring under no compression or extension is called the natural length now as soon as the spring is compressed there will be a force that will push the bodies that are trying to compress it similarly as soon as this is extended there will be a forces that will try to pull the bodies that are trying to extend the string okay the assumption here is the extension or compression is not very large okay so let's say in both the situations the x is the new length then the force 
due to the spring is k which is the spring constant times x minus x0. So if it is compressed then this term is negative. If it is extended that term is positive. So this is the force that acts on a spring. Now these type of forces are also electromagnetic forces. Okay. So we are aware of Newton's first law which states that a body continues its motion, uniform motion in a straight line unless acted upon by an external force. So which means if an external force is not present, so if external force is zero, then acceleration of that body is also zero. Okay. Now interestingly, this uh, law is not applicable in all frames of references. It is only applicable in certain frames of references and those frames of references are called inertial frames of reference. In fact, this law is a definition of an inertial frame of reference. But what is an inertial frame and a non-inertial frame? Let's look at that. So suppose we have an elevator okay, and it is hanging by a cable. And there is a lamp inside the elevator. There is a string which attaches the lamp. Okay. And let's suppose there is one person A inside the elevator and another person B outside the elevator on the ground. Okay. Now, it so happens that the elevator cable breaks and the entire elevator starts to come down with an acceleration g okay now so if i do a free body diagram of the lamp there is tension in the string and then there is weight of the lamp so the net force is w minus t in the downward direction Okay, both A and B would agree on this. Now, if A measures the acceleration of the lamp, then he would say that that acceleration is zero. Okay, so therefore, if he applies Newton's first law, then he will say W minus T is zero. Hence, W is equal to T. Okay. Now let's look at frame of reference of B. Now he sees that acceleration is not zero, it is G, right? So this is not zero. So W minus T, he puts together Newton's first law and he says W minus T is not zero, so W is not equals to T. Now both of these cannot simultaneously be right. So one of the frames of reference is definitely not a valid frame of reference and we should not be applying Newton's laws on those kind of frames of reference. So in this case, A's frame of reference is an invalid one and we call that a non-inertial frame. And B's frame of reference is called a inertial frame of reference. Okay. So indirectly, Newton's first law actually defines an inertial frame of reference in which you can apply the Newton's first laws. Okay, now let's suppose S is an inertial frame of reference. Okay, and let's suppose S dash is another frame of reference which is moving in a uniform motion with respect to S. Let's suppose we have a particle P which is accelerating at AP with respect to S, okay? Then acceleration of the particle with respect to S dashed plus acceleration of S dashed with respect to S gives the acceleration of the particle with respect to S, okay? 
Now, since we are saying S dash is moving in a uniform velocity with respect to S, then A S dash S is 0. So, there is no acceleration of S dash with respect to S. So, acceleration of a, the particle with respect to S inertial frame is equal to acceleration of the same particle with respect to S dash frame if S dash is moving in uniform velocity with respect to S which then implies that S dash itself is an inertial frame okay so all frames that are moving uniformly with respect to an inertial frame are themselves an inertial frame now Newton's second law is the definition of force but now that we have identified in which frames of references such forces should be measured, uh, let's formalize the definition of Newton's second law. So, Newton's second law states the force on any particle is the sum of all the forces that are acting on the particle and is measured as the product of mass of the particle and the acceleration of the particle as measured from an inertial frame of reference so that is important okay or in other words we can say the acceleration of a particle as measured from an inertial frame of reference is uh, the vector summation of all the forces that are acting on the particle divided by the mass of the particle okay let's also put vector summation here okay. all right so that is newton's second law one other thing is the instant the force ceases to act on that particle at the same instant the acceleration is zero now comes a very important topic how do we systematically apply Newton's first and second laws? Okay. Now, before attempting to write the equations of Newton's laws, we must be very clear about which particle we are considering. Now, it can be a particle or a group of particles in case of an extended uh, system. Um, we can do that. We can consider a group of particles. The only condition is the, all the particles in that extended system must have the same acceleration in magnitude as well as direction okay so if i have to write an algorithm as to how systematically we should write the equations for the newton's laws then let's put that steps of the algorithm first step would be decide the system what do you need to consider when deciding a system all parts of the system must have the same acceleration in magnitude and direction okay this is critical this is very important so first step is to decide the system okay let's understand this by an example Okay, consider this system. It kind of looks like a complex system. There are two blocks A and B, B sitting on A. It is connected by a string to C, goes over a master's pulley. There is a disc D, then there is another box E, goes over another master's pulley and then goes uh, connected to another box G and G is being pulled in the horizontal direction to the right with uh, force F. Okay, now if you see if we decide a system which all components of this can be a valid system valid systems could be a can be a valid system a plus b can be a valid system why because both of them are moving with the same acceleration towards the right c can be a valid system by itself 
A plus B plus C can be another valid system. Now can A, B, C and say for example E be a valid system? No, because although A, B and C all have the same acceleration in magnitude and direction, E has a different acceleration. It might have the same magnitude but the direction is different. So invalid system I can write let's say C plus E is an invalid system because both of them have different accelerations. Similarly the disk D plus E is also an invalid system because the disk D will have a very different acceleration than E. Okay. Now another valid system could be A plus B plus G because G again has the same acceleration in magnitude and direction as A, B and C. Okay. So these are valid systems and invalid systems. So obviously you cannot decide an invalid system and write equations of Newton's law on an invalid system. So make sure you are selecting or deciding a valid system and you can decide as many valid systems and write equations of motion for each of those systems which is basically all the forces that are acting on a, a, a valid system. Okay. Step number two is identify all the forces that are acting on the system okay and only identify those forces that are acting on the system a might be exerting a force on something else but if my system is a that force is not acting on a a is maybe uh, responsible for that force on someone else but in step number two the critical thing is to ensure that you write all the forces that are acting on the system. Okay. One other thing we must be very careful is to be able to identify all the forces. You cannot miss out any force. Okay, so both are critical. Identify all the forces and only those forces that are acting on the system. Okay, let's take an example. Let's say what if my system is C. Okay, so let's say my system is C. Okay, now what are the forces that are acting on C? So let me just break it down. A force exerted by direction okay and magnitude okay let's analyze C so C is pulled by the earth so direction is downwards and magnitude is whatever is the mass of C times G okay so that force is in the downward direction now this surface this surface exerts a normal reaction so force exerted by surface direction is upward and there is a normal reaction let's represent that by N now C is connected with a string to A and there is tension in the string. So we can say string connecting A and C. So that is exerting that force. The direction is away from C towards the left. Okay. And the magnitude let us assume that as T1. And then there is another string that is attached to the right right so string connecting c to d the direction is to the right and let's assume that tension is t2 okay now if it is mentioned that there is friction on this surface then kinetic friction will be in the 
direction opposite to the direction of the relative velocity of c with respect to the surface so which is relative velocity is to the right so the friction will be to the left so let's assume there is friction as well so ex force exerted by surface so there are two forces exerted by the surface one is the normal reaction one is the friction so we can write fr which is typically uh, coefficient of friction of the surface let's assume that as k k times the normal reaction so these are all the forces that are acting on the system now the list of forces will be different if I consider B as my system or if I consider A plus B plus C as my system okay when we consider A plus B plus C as the system then we only consider the external forces that are acting on the system any internal force between A and B or B and C those we can or A and C we can we have to ignore okay so that is step number two identify all the forces that are acting on the system step number three is make a free body diagram okay now if we have listed down all the forces that are acting on the system drawing a free body diagram is simple we can just extend this right so for example in our example for my system c all the forces we can write so this is mass times g there is a normal reaction n there is tension in the string t1 there is tension in the string t2 and there is friction in this direction as well f1 okay and we can also write supposedly this entire system is not in equilibrium it is moving with an acceleration w to the right okay so make a free body diagram step number four is choose axis and write the equations of Newton's laws okay so in this example then if we choose an axis typically we will say this is the x-axis this is the y-axis okay so once we have chosen the axis then then the last step is to write the equations of the Newton's laws so let's write those so since there are no acceleration in the y direction n is equal to m c g okay now in the x direction t2 minus t1 minus f r the friction this is responsible for this acceleration w in the right direction so mass of c so this will be the mass of the system that we have chosen mass of c times w okay so that is how we write the equations of newton's laws so obviously just looking at a system with c may not be able to solve everything about this complex arrangement so you can define a, another suitable system we can look at a and b as one system and follow the same steps and write the equations of Newton's laws and figure out some other uh, variables like the tension T1 is unknown probably we can find out the tension T1 from that okay then we might be able to consider A, B and C as one system and follow the steps write the equations of Newton's laws and we might be able to figure out the tension T2 from that okay so similarly we can do a lot of things but ensure always always ensure that you decide the system first make sure it is a valid system okay identify all the forces that are acting on the system make a free body diagram and then choose axis and write the equations of newton's laws finally let's talk about newton's third law so newton's third third law states that if a force f 
if a force F is exerted by an object A on B, then B exerts an equal and opposite force, so minus F on A. Okay. So, also very popularly said, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Now, the key thing here to understand is these two forces are acting on different bodies. This one is acting on B, minus F is acting on A. So, if you follow these rules, you will never have both these forces show up in the same equation of Newton's law because it is on different bodies or different systems. Okay. Only if A and B are combined together as one system, these forces become internal forces and they cancel out. Okay. So, with that, pretty much we are done with this uh, lesson for today. Next lesson, what we'll do is we'll use these principles and solve a lot of problems so as to show you why it is so critical to follow this algorithm before attempting to write any of those equations of Newton's laws and that will help us solve a lot of different problems without getting into any confusion or complexity. So we will take that up for the next lesson. Bye for now.